Hello Shishas, welcome to my lecture on Food and Fuel for Future. This is an non-academic topic. I have discussed about this topic in our uh, internal seminar session among the faculties. I thought this topic is also very important for you as you are taking part of futures uh, development. So some of you may also involve in developing proper food and fuel for all of us. As usual, let us begin with quote, the discovery of appropriate variables for biology is itself an act of creation. Brain Carey Goodwin. He is a biologist, mathematician, physician, so he greatly compared what could become, what could be considered as a creation in biology. So let us get into the topic. So these are the important things I am going to discuss in the next few minutes. Impact on natural resources, basic tools of biotechnology, brief overview, food improvement, fuel improvement, issues through an approach spelled. Now I am going to give you a brief overview on how the natural resources are greatly impacted by human activities. First is food. We have more population, less food. You can see the statistics of food inflation in India, particularly for the month of November. It's 3.8% inflation. And next is water. As we are living in metro cities, we know the value of water. And next is air. I extracted this data from the online database that monitors the air quality. So the term itself says AQI Air Quality Index. This PM stands for particulate matter 2.5. This is really bad enough for the people who are living in this place. Next is soil. We know about the value of soil where we can uh, make a lot of resources on it but we cannot see this resource is being produced in large quantities. We have to get adjust with what we have. Now let me show you an important uh, documentary about a place called Tar Sands in US. Let us try to understand through scientist. Canada's evergreen forests, known as Earth's northern lungs because of their enormous oxygen production, have been leveled across thousands of acres, replaced with men and machinery intent on getting to that oily sand that lies beneath the trees. The first time I saw tar sands, I thought it was in some post-apocalyptic movie because it looks like a, a moonscape where it used to be this, this lush forest. Over this time, we fought over two projects in there. Uh, how many more? It's about 100. Yeah. Here, low-grade crude oil, called bitumen, is extracted from the region's thick, sandy soil. So crude is this oil that its production emits at least 17% more carbon dioxide than oil refined in the U.S., and it takes much more energy to extract. In fact, it takes two barrels of oil to power the extraction of three barrels of bitumen. It just makes you crazy, makes you furious. What are you people thinking? You're not thinking. The tar sands has made Canada the largest carbon polluter per capita on Earth. And not even 10% of its oil deposits have been tapped. So far, about 300 square miles of forest have been stripped away. But the remaining oil sands deposits stretch across more than 54,000 square miles, a region almost as big as Florida. If tar sands development continues unabated, it could ultimately emit more carbon than the USA and China have in their entire histories combined. And the level of CO2 in the atmosphere could reach levels comparable to the mid-Pliocene epoch three million years ago, when the sea level was at least 50 feet higher than it is today. So Can you see what we learned from this video? We're going back, going back into the past in terms of natural resources development. Now we'll come to certain solutions provided by this field, particularly biotechnology. History of techniques development, 
our DNA technology stands for recombinant DNA technology, tissue culture, DNA sequencing, information technology. Now, let me introduce you the definition of biotechnology. It is simply defined as the commercialization of cell biology. The important contributions by these three people here, Oyager and Monk, you can easily guess what is their role in biology. Oyager is Charles Darwin, Monk is Mendel. Let there be DNA called by Frederick Meisner. Unraveling DNA is done by two scientists. Watson and Crick. And also you can see a person called Carl Ericke who given the term biotechnology and he is considered as the father of biotechnology. Now we'll try to understand more about the DNA structure as we know about the Voyager and Monk and also Frederick Meisner invention it is not required at this age but all we can easily differentiate the line between the modern development and uh, the old, the past development through a line called DNA structure understanding. Now let me show you the borders of biotechnology through a small clip of video. As late as 1951, the chemical structure of DNA remained a tantalizing enigma. At Cambridge University in England, biologist James Watson and physicist Francis Crick had been working to unlock the secrets of the DNA molecule. But they weren't alone. Several other groups of competing scientists were hard at work trying to solve the same puzzle. Some important facts about DNA were already known. For instance, scientists knew that DNA was composed of four bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. They also had been able to infer something about its structure with the help of X-ray crystallography. This technique involved passing an X-ray beam through a crystallized DNA molecule and capturing a vague shadowy image of its internal structure on a photographic plate. Armed with this information, along with their own knowledge of chemical structure, Watson and Crick began building a three-dimensional model of DNA. I wanted an arrangement, you know, where I had a big and a small molecule, and uh, somehow you had to, to form link bonds. Here's uh, A, and here's T, and uh, I wanted this hydrogen to point directly at this nitrogen. So I had something like this. Ooh. So then I went to the, the pair and wanted this nitrogen to point to this one. And I went like this. Whoa. Today, you can buy a kit and assemble the structure that Watson and Crick put together but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Watson and Crick needed more data. With the help of physicist Maurice Wilkins, they gained access to an X-ray picture of a DNA molecule that had been taken by his research partner. Her name was Rosalind Franklin. Without her knowledge, Watson and Crick used the data from that X-ray image and successfully completed their model. In a 1953 issue of Nature magazine, Watson and Crick revealed their amazing discovery to the world. Their model showed that the DNA molecule was a double helix. The twin strands were composed of pairs of the four known bases linked together by hydrogen bonds. And the whole structure corkscrewed like a spiral ladder, which could easily pull apart in order to make copies of itself with the same encoded genetic information. Watson and Crick had won the race. The discovery of the structure of DNA sparked a scientific revolution 
It illuminated the molecular and biochemical foundation of life in a whole new way. It opened doors for areas of research and other great discoveries that few ever imagined possible. As for Watson and Crick, their discovery of the double helix, along with Maurice Wilkins, won them a share of the 1962 Nobel Prize. And what of Wilkins' colleague, Rosalind Franklin? Despite her contribution to the discovery, she wasn't considered for the 62 prize. The rules state that it can only be awarded to a living recipient. Rosalind Franklin died in 1958 of... Nice. Now I'll try to understand uh, the basic tool of biotechnology called odd DNA technology or recombinant DNA technology. In the blue color you can see the donor DNA and other side you'll see vector. To understand this very easily, I'll tell you, uh, the donor DNA refers to the DNA where you have certain features to be manipulated. Got it? For example, if you consider donor DNA is from human, you have a particular gene which is coding insulin. And when you insert into a vector that can take that and it can be able to reproduce and uh, it gives a proper result in, ter in, in terms of insulin. So through the screening we can remove the insulin product inside the bacterial cell and it can inject to the patients who badly requires it. So this is how simply our DNA technology is useful for solving most of the biotechnological uh, challenges. Now we learn about one more important tool which is called DNA sequencing. This is done by this gentleman called Frederick Sanger. So he got two Nobel Prizes for these two inventions. Structure of insulin which is nearly 51 amino acid structure and base sequence is nucleic acids. What is one of the base sequence in nucleic acids? We knew that uh, today is very easily we can tell that A, G, C, T forms a DNA sequence but we cannot tell how exactly it is present. Through the method developed by Frederick Sanger we are able to tell exactly how A, T, G, C composition is present all over your chromosome. So this is great, isn't it? With the help of this we are able to do a project called Human Genome Project. We have all sequences of uh, chromosomes are sequenced and made available a kind of library. You can call it as human genome library. You can find it online. Now I'm talking about tissue culture. You might have heard a lot about it. We can produce the plants in the lab itself in multiple numbers with desired quantities in very short span also. This tissue culture method requires any part of the plant, any vegetative part of the plant by proper protocol procedure we can able to make the whole plant inside a small test tube and gradually we can transfer to the soil and it can be able to grow as an individual plant. This tissue culture method influenced a lot of fields like plant or agriculture development and also in animals like tissue culture developments. Now I'm going to introduce you uh, the basic tools of biotechnology with information technology. Here I try to provide you these uh, three important databases available online. So one is called NCBI maintained by United States and uh, PDB, Protein Data Bank and uh, KEG, Keto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomics. You know, uh, it is uh, an accessible information. You know, in previous days it was a big problem for all the people. For example, if someone is doing work in London, they cannot share any information to a scientist who is doing his work in India. But now, it is like fraction of seconds we can do share anything 
through this information technology we have very easy uh, availability or get in hands with the sequences so this helps in fastening the development of diagnostic methods or research in many manners and it also one of the economical benefit for the for the for the small institutes where they can't afford to do a large number of experiments they can download some information and they can be able to understand it better i'm not giving a deeper look over these databases because it's not required for you this time now let's look into the food importance so how food is going a lot of changes by introducing this biotechnology methods into agriculture you can see the important agricultural uses we can actually introduce some bacteria so that can protect the plants roots from the insects we call those plants as transgenic plants we have the plants which can kill insects like bt corn bt refers to bacillus thuringiensis which is effective on the insects like pests and next is the plants that are specifically engineered to resist against the herbs sorry the the ones which consume the herbs so here you can see uh, the roundup ready plants these are group of plants that can resist uh, the herbivores so they cannot they won't like to consume it so roundup ready uh, a group of plants in us we have a uh, soya bean so a variety of soya bean is there which is called as roundup soya bean interesting no let me ask you a question if you go to a supermarket here uh, the the seller has introduced you these two things the one is bt corn and the one is the normal variety obviously you may choose the right the right sided uh, corns but still it is made up of the uh, bacillus thuringiensis genome inside it you know this is how the the changes happening very rapidly in terms of agriculture we always require the quality and uh, desired color smell whatever so all these things able to control and we'll be able to manipulate it easily by controlling the genes but the wild varieties they do have some difficulties it is very difficult to get over those things but still we're all going towards future so these wild varieties may not be increased a lot of time that's why the farmers and some scientists are very much uh, concerned about the development of biotechnology and the crops this is recent news uh, in us we have a, a group of genetically modified super wheat is introduced and it is showing nearly 20% of more harvest so now now i'm going to tell you some interesting information for all non vegetarians who are listening to me okay so over so far i talked about a lot of vegetarian products now the scientists are really working hard to develop the cultured meat this is a, a simple biotechnological method we'll have a starter cells that are extracted through biopsy and in the second step we also grow some biodegradable or edible parts called scaffolds when we combine one two one refers to starter cells second is scaffolds and third we'll get the starter cells growing on the biodegradable or edible products and then we just put it inside something called bioreactor with growth medium so this growth medium provides all the essential nutrients and conditions for the starter cell to develop and make or a form a layer as soon as the product has done and we are going to transfer it to a vacuum packet 
So this vacuum packet preserves food from the microorganisms and step 6 you can find it any store in future soon. So this is how the cultured meat can be prepared. This can answer most of the non vegetarians problems in future. Now we're, go we're going to important part food and feed applications of algae. Uh, this is a journal extracted from a book. So it's really interesting. So how the world is you know going very much advanced to find a lot of issues of our own. So first is Porphyra, it is a red algae. You can see how Chinese are able to uh, grow this Porphyra and edible algae. Along with this they are also producing oysters. So with this the farmers can actually take a lot of benefit from the salt water. Next is the Euchema, the, the species very common in uh, Philippines even it is called as guso this can be dried packed can be consumed later as well as this has uh, more nutrient values many people in Philippines actually depend on their uh, bread and butter for this next so this is another uh, approach in biotechnology to improve microalgae. You might have known that a lot of algae has a variety of nutrients. So here in raceway ponds they can grow a large number of microalgae and they can filter it and they can be able to make the desired things like tablets or any essential things whatever required. So this is also one of the cost effective man cost effective way of producing a large number of microalgae. And now I'm going to show you the economical changes that took place from 1987 to 2013. Here you can see how the microalgae and seaweed uh, cost is increasing day by day. So the supplements, the microalgae supplements like spirulina is nearly $210. Uh, the recent statistics are not available. Let's expect even it could be more. And even you can see lots of Ayurvedic products produced by Patanjali in their medicines will consist of most of this algae. And now I'm coming to my favorite part, fuel. Can algae be the answers for all? Maybe. Now if you look at uh, the biofuels the, the biodegradable fuels in the primary stages it is considered as firewood, wood chips, pellets, animal waste dry and uh, crop residues, landfill gas etc. Now the secondary way of consuming it has changed drastically here you can see in the first generation we use seeds, grains and sugars to, ma to make uh, the first generation of biofuels. In second generation we moved ahead as seeds grains are really uh, required for the food we skipped it and we started with lignocellulose biomasses and uh, this method is also like not giving proper result and now we are going to third generation with algae and seaweeds as uh, we have more more amount of water seawater all around us so we are, we are actually focused on developing uh, certain algae and seaweeds which can give us bioethanol. Now we will see the, the criticism around biofuels. Many countries are actually opposing biofuels. The reason is this. You can see the feedstocks and the, the biotechnological method and converted biofuel here. Most of the cases uh, these things are really essential for their livestock there. So when it is sacrificed for giving for fuels this can make actually a lot of uh, issues in the people so that's why a lot of people all around the world they are not really encouraged by the idea of biofuel but still algae depending on algae is really a good idea by by making a large amount of biomass in the oceans and then producing uh, fuel from it 
Now I'm going to show you an important uh, method. We already learned about photosynthesis, at least from 7th class onwards, you might have known that. So here you can see how photosynthesis is really effective now. In photosynthesis and uh, respiration, you can see where are various pathways that can make different products. When this process is really commercialized enough, then all our fuel necessities will be solved without any worries, isn't it? You can actually look at this uh, reaction very closely. Uh, this ethanol formation region, you can see this is uh, uh, respiration and you can see in photosynthesis how photosynthesis is giving out uh, the molecules and how these are being converted into energy molecules. So let's hope the future can actually give us by decoding small reaction of photosynthesis and respiration together into biofuels. Now the spelt approach. So how socially fuels can impact and uh, political impacts, economical, legal and technological impacts. This is very important approach in debates generally. That's why I introduce you here. Social changes uh, are affecting the food and fuel habits. The next is political. It's open truth that many political parties are not really encouraging the food and fuel improvements in a proper way. Next is economical benefits. You know that oil refineries are really stopping a lot of essential uh, alternate methods of fuel nowadays. And next is legal. In legal also, uh, there are many issues how the scientists are able to address the legal issues like food necessities and they can solve the uh, proper answers. And if you look at technological approaches, technology is always more than required but still converting into human and uh, uh, nature friendly things is really important role should be played by technological things. Now, let me uh, show you the great person who was picked by Nobel Committee as one of the greatest scientists for discovery nearly 60 genes responsible for autophagy. Autophagy refers to the self-killing of cells. So how even we use a term called apoptosis to understand this. So this gentleman Oshinori Oshumi for discovery of this uh, autophagy and discovering the important genes. So his studies helped us to crack the cancer uh, genes and how we can control the cancer as well. Great contribution. So this is it from me today. Take care. Uh, well, before finishing, let me show you some references. Actually, many more references should be there. Actually, missed it. So one of the references is biofuel technologies, recent developments.